getting two hours a day of outdoor time without sunglasses has a significant effect on reducing the probability that you will get myopia. When we hear the word vision, we most often think about eyesight or our ability to perceive shapes and objects and faces and colors. However, our eyes are responsible for much more than that, including our mood, our level of alertness, and all of that is included in what we call vision. Let's talk about what the eyes do for vision. Basically, the entire job of the eyes is to collect light information and send it off to the rest of the brain in a form that the brain can understand. We have specific cells in the eye called photoreceptors. They come in two different types, rods and cones. Cones are mainly responsible for daytime vision and the rods are mainly responsible for vision at night or under low light conditions, generally speaking. So basically what happens is if your eyelids are open, light comes into the eye, the lens focuses that light Light is also just called photons, light energy, onto the retina. These photoreceptors, the rods and cones, have chemical reactions inside them that involve things like vitamin A. And that chemical reaction converts the light into electricity. Within the eye, within the retina, there are then a, a series of stages of processing. And that information eventually gets sent into the brain by a very specific class of neurons. They're called retinal ganglion cells. Everything you see around you, you're not actually seeing those objects directly. What you're doing is you're making a best guess about what's there based on the pattern of electricity that arrives in your brain. Let's take a, a, an example of a color like green or blue. You have cones in your eye that respond best to the wavelength of light that is reflected off, say, a green apple. So you don't actually see the green apple. What you see is the light bouncing off that green apple and it goes into your eye and you see it and perceive it as round and green. Your brain actually compares the amount of green reflection coming off that apple to the amount of red and blue around it. Well, you might say, well, the green apple is sitting on a brown table or a white surface. Well, then it will appear very green. Light information is transformed into electrical signals that your visual system exquisitely understands. So first things first, your visual system was not for seeing faces, motion, etc. The most ancient cells in your eye, which are there right now as we speak, are there to inform your body and brain about time of day. These are so-called melanopsin retinal ganglion cells named after the opsin that they contain within them. Melanopsin cells, as the name suggests, melanopsin, have their own photoreceptor built inside them. These cells, retinal ganglion cells, communicate to areas of the brain when particular qualities of light are present in your environment and signal to the brain, therefore, that it's early day or late in the day. What do these cells respond to and why should you care about them? Well, you should care about them because they regulate when you'll get sleepy, when you'll feel awake, how fast your metabolism, metabolism is, excuse me, your blood sugar levels, your dopamine levels, and your pain threshold. These melanopsin ganglion cells have been shown to set the circadian clock and to respond best to the contrast between blue and yellow light of the sort that lands on these cells when you view the sun when it's at so-called low solar angle, when it's low in the sky, either in the morning or in the evening. What does all this mean? It means, and here's the first protocol, if you are not viewing the sun, sunlight, even through cloud cover for two to 10 minutes in the early part of the day when the sun is still low in the sky, and doing the same thing again in the evening, you are severely disrupting your sleep rhythms, your mood, your hormones, your metabolism, your pain threshold, and many other factors, including your ability to learn and remember information. Here's another reason to do this, and I've never spoken about this before on any podcast, which is that what can be done to prevent myopia, nearsightedness, and other visual defects? Getting two hours a day 
of outdoor time without sunglasses, blue light, this blue light that everyone has demonized, getting that sunlight during the day for two hours, even if you're reading other things and doing other things outside, has a significant effect on reducing the probability that you will get myopia. I'm going to describe this study just briefly, but this is a second protocol, which is ideally, and this includes children as long as they're not very small infants, ideally we're all getting two hours of outdoor time, even if there's cloud cover. So I just want to briefly describe this study because it's a very important one and I don't think it's discussed often. 693 students and a subset of them were encouraged to spend 11 hours a week outdoors. They used eight different schools. This paper published in the journal Ophthalmology in 2018 described the fact that being outdoors for two hours a day could, could significantly reduce the probability that these children would develop nearsightedness. And it turns out, based on other studies, that adults who spend two hours a day outside so that would be reading outside, talking outside, offset the, the formation of myopia. Now, accommodation is our ability to accommodate to things that are up close here or further away. And the way this works is that the iris and, a, and a, the musculature and a structure called the ciliary body move the lens. So it relaxes, it can flatten out. Whereas if I look at something up close to me, like this pen or my phone or a computer screen or this microphone, it takes effort. You'll sense the effort. Now, some of that effort is actually eye movements because you have muscles that can move your eyes within their sockets. But a lot of the work to move and contract such that the lens actually gets thicker in order to bring the light to the retina and not to a location in front of it or behind it, so-called accommodation. You might say, why are you telling me about accommodation? If you are a young person, and even if you are 25 or older, and you are spending a lot of time looking at things up close, and you are not allowing your vision to relax, you may or may not have migraine headaches, you may or may not have headaches, you might, and that could be the cause of those, but you are also training your eyes to be good at looking at things up close and not far away, and as a consequence, you are reshaping the neural circuitry in your brain, and it is not good it is not healthy. So what's the protocol? How often should you do this? You might be surprised, but for every 30 minutes of focused work, you probably want to look up every once in a while and just try and relax your face and eye muscles, including your jaw muscles, because all these things are closely linked in the brainstem and allow your eyes to go into a so-called panoramic vision where you're just not really focusing on anything and then refocus on your work. At least every 90 minutes, I want to emphasize another protocol. Getting into optic flow is very important for de-stressing your system. When you move through space, whether or not it's through walking, biking, even swimming, meaning you're generating motion of your body and the visual images around you are passing by on your eyes, that is very good for the visual system. And it's very good for the mood systems and the neuromodulator systems of the brain and body that regulate mood. This is well-established. How can you improve your vision? One way is to make sure that you spend at least 10 minutes a day total viewing things off in the distance. So that would be well over half a mile or more. So try and see at a distance because it's good for your eyesight. It'll keep this lens nice and elastic and the muscles nice and strong that move the lens. And it has this relaxing component to it. Smooth pursuit is our ability to track individual objects moving, as the name suggests, smoothly through space in various trajectories. You can actually train or improve your vision by looking at smooth pursuit stimuli. Take a few minutes each day, or maybe if you don't do it each day, you could do every third day or so, and actually just visually track a ball. Sometimes it's moving in in kind of an infinity symbol. Sometimes it's more of a sawtooth. Sometimes it's changing speed. Sometimes the, uh, the cue that you're following, the little target is um, dilating and contracting. It's going to keep the extraocular muscles conditioned and strong and allow you to have a healthy, smooth pursuit system. Remember, the brain follows the eye. It follows the movements of the eye. I would say five to 10 minutes, three times a week 
will be great. If you care about your vision, you can train your vision in this way, as well as near far. So spending a few minutes, you might even just do this for two minutes of looking at something up close. That's going to activate these accommodation mechanisms and then moving it at arm's length and focusing on it for five, 10 seconds, maybe more, maybe uh, 15 or 20 seconds, then slowly moving it into a location and then out. The tool is spend two to three minutes doing smooth pursuit. There's some programs on YouTube. You could do this with a pen if you wanted. (laughs) Practice accommodation for a few minutes, maybe every other day. Just bring something in close. You'll feel the strain of your eyes doing that. I can feel it right now. Move it out. You'll feel a relaxation point. Move it past that relaxation point where you will have to do what's called a virgin side movement to maintain focus on that location as it moves out. Bring it back in. It's worth doing. It's really worth preserving your vision. And again, if you're a young person, this is great because then you can actually build an extra strong visual system using all the tools that we're describing. One of the things that you can do to improve your vision, and it's also kind of fun, is to put a Snellen chart in your home. A Snellen chart is that list of letters. If you go to the dreaded Department of Motor Vehicles, you cover up an eye, read the, the letters on the chart. The letters, of course, get smaller and smaller. They're trying to figure out roughly what your vision is. Cover up the other eye. You'll do that. Some people, including nerdy vision scientists like me, have had Snellen charts in their office or in their home uh, for many years now. And you can just practice and you can see how you're doing sitting at a particular distance. This might seem excessively nerdy, but what is more important than your eyesight? right? Eyesight is so vital. It's right up there with movement and our ability to move, to generate, to get up out of chairs and to walk and to run and to to take care of ourselves. Eyesight and movement are the main ways that we are able to take care of ourselves and take care of others. When you start having compromised eyesight or compromised movement, people need to take care of us and we become much more challenged in moving through our daily life. There are a few simple things you can do to support your vision. First of all, it is true that eating vegetables, the dark leafy vegetables, carrots that have vitamin A, and eating them in close to their raw form can help support vision. Now, does that mean that if you ingest super physiological amounts of that stuff that it's going to make your vision that much better? No, but you do need a threshold level of vitamin A in order to see. Now, there's a lot of excitement nowadays about supplementation to help support the health of the visual system. But I want to talk about a molecule that's in a lot of supplements to support vision. And there are some really good data on, and that's lutein. What is this lutein stuff? Well, lutein is in the pathway that relates to vitamin A and the formation of the opsin, the photopigment that captures light in the back of your eye, literally absorbs light pigment in your eye and converts that into electrical signals and allows you to see. There is some evidence through quality peer-reviewed studies that supplementing with lutein can help offset some of the detrimental effects of age-related macular degeneration, but only for individuals with moderate to severe macular degeneration. Whereas if you have normal vision or a low amount of macular degeneration. It does not seem, at least from these studies, that lutein can have much of an effect. If I personally had age-related macular degeneration or a propensity for it in my family, in that case, I would think that supplementing with lutein, provided it's safe, could perhaps be of benefit. You might want to consider a low dose of that. 